Speaking of being everywhere, I got a, I had an email from the, one of the Cult of Cornet members. And of course, I can't find it now, so I'm going to paraphrase it. But the gist of the email was, gosh, you talk about how you like to cut down on your traveling these days and you don't like to travel as much. I bet during your many years in wrestling, you had a lot of stressful trips. Can you tell any horror stories about travel? Because you see <clears throat> on Twitter these days, everybody's tweeting they're stuck in the airport or whatever right what are your horror stories um and i just i had jotted down a couple because i thought the folks might be interested brian do you think give me some encouragement do you think the folks might be interested in some of the more miserable times i have traveled from one place to the other i think they would be interested i think i'd be interested and i hope at some point the airliner in comes up on this show oh god well no that wasn't a bad trip it was just a bad destination uh <laughs> <laughs> when we spent the night in the airliner in at the Chicago Midway airport in 19 fucking God, what was it? 88 with, uh, Dick Murdoch and no, it may be even 87 with Dick Murdoch and me and the midnight express. That was, uh, that was what that was really, once again, a, a case of the trip was great. And the planning by Crockett's people at the end of it, they thought we were flying into O'Hare and had everybody, uh, rooms at O'Hare airport. And, but instead they flew into midway and it was three in the morning and there were no cabs. Nobody would come and get us. We were straight. We've got one cab and, and we're 40 miles from O'Hare airport. So we're trying to find a hotel there at, at midway. And they say, Oh, the airliner Inn says they have rooms. So four at a time, it's only a mile from midway four at a time. This one cab at three o'clock in the morning ferries us back and forth from the airport, three and four guys, uh, depending on who could fit in at a time. And that we check in and we got the last, uh, me, Bobby, Stan and Murdoch got the last four rooms and the stands didn't have a lock on the door, uh, from the outside, from the inside, you could lock it, but, 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 <laughs> but from the outside, you could just walk up and go in and listen. Somebody was in there and had locked it from the inside. And Bobby's room had three beds, different sizes and different makes. <laughs> and, and, le and, and my room had basically a, a phone on a desk next to the bed. And there was a hole where the red light should be for messages. And there was no dial. And there's a time dial phones, but there was no dial. It was just the, it was the blank face of it. <clears throat> I thought, oh my God, that can't work. So I ended up, I go next door to the fucking white castle and I, to use the pay phone and get something to eat. And I, after I called my wife and I told her wh where we were, what the fuck was going on. I walk in, there's Paul Jones sitting there with this look on his face. I says, what's the matter? He said, don't eat here. I think the, the food is spoiled. And I to <laughs> smelled it. I said, no, it's white castle. It's supposed to taste that way. Paul It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and then I go back to my room where I hear screaming in the room next door to me and, and I don't know what to think. So I turn on the TV to try to drown it out a little bit. Right. And it comes to find out it's the porn in house porn channel. They have four channels. Two of them are porn, two of them are TV and it's a black and white television in 1988. So <laughs> I, 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 at least I'm watching the same movie. The guy next door is watching. Right. When all of a sudden the dead phone rings. And the dead fan, I fall, oh, fuck. I'm thinking I'm going to answer it. It's going to, I've come back or something like that. Right. No, I answered. It's Bobby. He, he, he had picked up his phone and the, it rang at the switchboard at the desk. And the creepy guy <laughs> that checked us in had to put you through to whoever you want. You had to like to call Sarah at BR549. <clears throat> and I forgot to mention when he checked us in, uh, Bobby's room didn't have a uh, 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 Murdoch's room didn't have linens. So this guy in a fucking hospital gown, bathrobe type of thing, open in the back and slippers walks out. He called him, Hey, Carl. And this guy looked like he just had a fucking lobotomy walked out and handed him the clean sheets. So Diggy could take. So anyway, it, it was horrible. And, and none of us got any sleep because Bobby was calling. He's like, corny. I'm scared. <laughs> Well, didn't Bobby have an incident in a hotel before this? Well, if Bobby sleepwalked, if he ate spicy food or pepperoni pizza or whatever, Bobby was sleepwalk, right? 
So he, in under normal circumstances, if he'd had something questionable for dinner, he would put furniture in front of the door so it would prevent him. Because one time they found him in the lobby in his underwear, sleep on the couch, and he so he would sleepwalk. So in this case, there was hardly any furniture in his fucking rooms. He didn't know whether he'd be walking down the fucking hall in his sleep and go into a crack deal or whatever the fuck gone wrong. So. Nobody gets any sleep. Everybody's fucking miserable. It's an afternoon show the next day in Chicago. So we meet in the lobby at like 11 in the morning, trying to get the fuck out of there. Me and Stan and Bobby were miserable. And here comes Murdoch whistling and fucking got that spring in his step. Hey, boys, how you doing? How'd you sleep? And we're like, fuck, we were all fucking miserable. This goddamn dump. And he said, oh, hell, it's me and Rhodes one night. We stayed in a hotel and we went to sleep. We woke up the next morning. We had four inches of snow on top of us. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't give a shit. He went right to fucking sleep and slept like a fucking baby. <laughs> oh. No, but didn't Bobby <laughs> once walk in on someone? He thought it was his room and there was someone in the room. Oh, no, it, it was his room. See, I've done that, too. And, it, it, and you need to be careful because this computerized key business does not prevent people from doing this when you see when you check in hotels a lot and you see the level of let's say training that the staff has probably gotten for in the middle of nowhere or at a a big city hotel airport where they'll just take anybody because there's hundreds of those hotels in the middle of the night they get they fuck up and they give you a room they've already given to somebody else and if that's somebody else this happened to me in in uh, newark with it on a wwf trip all the guys checked in and I walk all the way down this goddamn hall and up and down in this long walk, carrying my bags, open, stick the key in the knob, open the fucking door. And as I fling it open from the hall light, the room is dark, but I can see fucking feet hanging off the end of both of the twin beds with cover all fucking Jabadada. Fuck. And they were male. And I, you know, <laughs> I slammed the door real quick and ran as fast as I could back down the hall and turn the corner so that if they came out, they wouldn't see me because the door had slammed. But I'm like, I get shot. Who knows what the fuck? But they give you they give you occupied rooms. You always have to <clears throat> when you're in it, sl- close the fucking you know latch thing and and always put the do not disturb out. And give as many signs as you can that that room is occupied. Is keep the do not disturb out when you're not in the room. You're insane if you don't do that. I'm just telling you. Because that'll make people go, hey, I better go and fucking ask about this, right? But as far as, as harrowing or stressful, and I mean, I think that's why today I have a time disorder. Uh, I, I, it almost like It's almost like PTSD. Right. I, I always wear a watch. I've always if I'm in a room some like if I'm in bed, I have to be able to see a clock. If I open my eyes, I have to there has to be one close enough to me that I can see even with my glasses off. Know what time, I have to know what time it is at all points of the day. I estimate my time in my head. If I'm going if I, my errands, I know within 15 minutes how long it's going to take me to do a variety of things and come back home on a 700 mile trip. I can I can call Stacy and I know how long it takes to drive blah 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 and I can estimate the time I will be home I'll be there with it ex, except for horrible traffic snafus I'm 15 minutes either way I always have time in my head because w- the traveling that we did it wasn't just that some of the trips were hard it's that we were always in a hurry because when you worked every day in different cities Without days off, sometimes for weeks at a time, you were always in a hurry to go somewhere, which is why that I now not only hate to go anywhere, but I hate to be in a fucking hurry. And it can be anything like from the time that, that the Midnight Express and I had left Louisiana and moved to Dallas, we're working world class. But we were booked in Houston, which was a Mid-South town on Easter Sunday. <clears throat> now, to be honest with you. We hadn't, I had only been in business a couple of years, but we, we had never basically worked Easter in Texas. It's not that big of, of a traffic uh, problem in the Tennessee territory or Carolinas or whatever, <clears throat> especially in those days. But I'm just telling you from driving from Dallas to Houston on Easter Sunday at, at, for a 
uh, for us was was incredible. The the interstates were gridlocked, and we're we're fucking pulling our hair out and fucking our fingernails out. And Dennis Condry is driving. Thanks, thank God, because he's going down the emergency lane for miles at a time with the flashers on, honking the fucking horn. Like we're you know we've just found out our entire family has been slaughtered by the you know fucking the Huns. <laughs> And we got to get home, right? And he's going off ramps and back on. And my God, because we've got the clock ticking because not only will we get fucking yelled at, but it's Mid-South. So if we're more than 15 minutes late for an hour before bell time, it's going to cost us 50 bucks a piece too. <clears throat> so we're at, I don't know how we, but it was just like, it was one of those nail biters. It looked like an action movie for four hours. You're in steady panic that you're going to be late. Uh, you, it's going to cost you money. You're in this fucking traffic. So those were stressful. But then uh, other stuff was stressful when you were when you were sitting still. Like I told a story in my book, and I've told a story before. But for whatever reason, in Mid South Wrestling, the day of the last stampede in Little Rock, Arkansas, at the Barton Coliseum, they booked us because it was a Sunday. They booked a Sunday afternoon spot show at like one o'clock in. And I can't even remember, but it was a town in Arkansas about an hour and a half away from Little Rock. And we're out there, they're going to draw an all time record breaking crowd, as Nick Goulas would say. Literally, they're going to sell out to Barton Coliseum, 7,000 plus people, draw the biggest gate they've ever drawn in the town. And of course, Watts and, and, and Dog are in Little Rock, but the Midnight Express is where whoever we're, we're working with. The point is, there's like. 10 guys on the little rock card working in this little town in, in, in Arkansas that afternoon. So I, but that's the way the territories worked. You just did it. So naturally, since we're in the main event of the hot match, Dennis's van from hell that he bought from Stan Lane in Tennessee. And, and boy, I wish those van walls could have talked to give me something to do on these 500 mile fucking trips. <laughs> um, but Dennis's van breaks down and I'll never, we were in star city, Arkansas. Look it up on well, – I know everybody has a Rand McNally Road Atlas uh, with an easy reach like I do here. But it, look up on a map somewhere on your computers where Star City, Arkansas is today. And then think over 30 years ago what a podunk fucking piece of shit town this was. <laughs> and we are broke down and we're an hour away from – which we – I think our payoff for that night was 1500 bucks a piece, which today would be you know three to four grand or whatever in today's money. So we're stressing now we're not going to make it. And we get to a, a – literally, we saw people working on a fucking lawnmower out in a parking lot of a lawnmower business. And we got them, believe it or not, to fix, I don't know anything about cars, whatever the fuck it was, the water pump, or it was something within their level of competence to fix that fucking thing so that we finally made it after the show had already started. And there's no cell phones then. And we had the number for the box office, but because of the the box office had stopped answering the phones because they were ringing off the hook because they locked the front gates of the goddamn of uh, Barton Coliseum at seven o'clock because nobody else could get in. So we, there's no way for us to tell anybody what's happened to us. <laughs> and so we come in, the first match is already in and Dundee looked like they turned a bucket of fucking the, he was the booker then looked like he turned a bucket of water over his head. He was sweating. Trying, Fuck are they going to get here? And that's when I first heard him say, well, God damn it. If you're going to be fucking late, be so late. We're glad to see you. Uh, but so that was another harrowing trip, even though it was, it was only 90 miles, it, it was hell and we were delayed and everybody was fucking sweating or there was a, a literally, and th this was in the midnight express book also Christmas week of 86 in, <clears throat> in, uh, the Charlotte, uh, Crockett's territory. We worked, I believe it was Christmas night in Charlotte. On a Friday, and then Saturday morning, we went to Atlanta and did the two Atlanta TV shows for that weekend. And then that night, flew to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we had a show, and then flew back to Greensboro, North Carolina, from Minneapolis the next afternoon for an afternoon event at the Greensboro Coliseum, which was the Bunkhouse Stampede. And then, for whatever reason, and I swear to you, this took place. They booked 
a Greensboro matinee, and they booked Albuquerque, New Mexico at the Tingley Coliseum at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time that night. <laughs> what? That's yeah. crazy. And because Crockett had a plane, see, he had that, he had just got that fucking jet, not the jabroni jet, the prop jet that they couldn't take really pretty much past the Mississippi. It was too slow, but they got that Falcon jet and somewhere or another, they figured out if they split up their talent, cause the Falcon jet seated 10 people, they could take dusty and flair and the road warriors and a couple of the horsemen and whatever your 10 guys, right? And they could have some of the guys in Greensboro and they could have some of the guys in Albuquerque and pick up a few locals out there and they could make this work. And they're going to show off this new plane, right? Well, they fucking forgot here. A couple things. One, they forgot about the managers. So me and JJ Dillon were booked on both cards and had to fly commercial. So we, I don't know if JJ made it out that day, but because the, the midnight express were only in the, bunkhouse stampede so think about this on friday night we started home in charlotte we worked a big show there at the charlotte coliseum we go to atlanta saturday morning do the two tv tapes then we go to minneapolis and do the goddamn saturday night house show we're already back in greensboro north carolina on sunday afternoon and they said well Cornette, you you and jj got to fly commercial so if if the bunkhouse stampede is not up by so and so you don't need to go out so i got paid like on that big house in greensboro like 750 bucks just to show up there and stand around and got in a cab with jj we went to the greensboro airport now of course they have non stops from greensboro to albuquerque constantly um we had to fly through chicago so we at united airlines we get on these fucking middle seats from Greensboro to Chicago and then Chicago to Albuquerque. I had not, I was still in my suit. I didn't even change clothes yet. Right. I put the racket in the suit bag, had my bags with me and JJ the same. And we got in a cab and we went to the Tingley Coliseum. We flew across two time zones in doing that. Oh, and in Chicago, we had to get off of the, of the old stairs that they would wheel up and then walk across the tarmac and do the other thing. Cause it was fucking fucked up gate deal. We got out of the cab and I walk in the back of the Tingley Coliseum and they say, we're in intermission. I'm like, thank God. They say, we're ringing the bell in two minutes. It's your match with the road warriors. It was the midnight versus the road warriors because Crockett's plane hadn't had to stop in Chicago. So the guys that worked this, this bunkhouse stampede in Greensboro actually beat us to fucking Albuquerque. <clears throat> and then that night we got to go to bed and get up the next morning and fly to Los Angeles and then San Francisco. And then on New Year's Eve, 1986, San Francisco back to Charlotte. Cause we were off that night and we were back in the Omni, uh, on New Year's day in Atlanta. This is another reason I don't like to travel any Smoky mountain wrestling TV taping. What was a harrowing experience because I had probably literally uh, just finished all the paperwork, run it off on the copy machine in my house. And I was, and Brian Hildebrand might even be driving, driving while I was making notes <laughs> because I was going to be the person that was going to get there first, do the production meeting. And then I was going to lay it out to all the talent. And then I was going to be involved as the top heel manager in, in uh, several segments, each of all four television shows. So those were, and they were being shot in places like Clinchco, Virginia, and Everett's Kentucky and, and my God, the, the infamous taping in Clarefield, Tennessee, where the gym at the school that they told us they had turned out to be literally a basketball court with room for three rows of chairs on three sides of it in a concrete block building. And we somehow managed to pull off a television taping out of there. When I'm on the way driving myself by myself at one point on the way to a Smoky Mountain television taping <clears throat> up in the hills of Western Virginia, and I'm running late, and I'm behind a bunch of traffic, and they're going around something. I can't see up the top of the hill, and finally I get there's this big truck half on, half off the fucking road, broke down on the side of the road. And as I'm going around and I'm giving them a finger, I'm like, you motherfuckers, I'm, that's my ring truck. The fucking ring was broke down on the top of the mountain. I had to get to the goddamn school and send people back to the, to get the fucking ring, to drag it the rest of the way up the mountain so we could set it up for television. So that was a harrowing trip. 
<clears throat> or anytime I've been in a blizzard trying to drive one time me in the midnight express in Western North Carolina, uh, trying to drive to this spot show town in the middle of the winter time, we couldn't see and we couldn't even figure out how to turn around and go back or whether we were just going to be stuck there or me and Stacy one time going to ring of honor in New York in a, a sudden blizzard that came a day early through West Virginia. It took us a, a, a two days to, to drive 12 hours. Um, you know, that, that there's but one time I I actually when I was co-hosting Raw in I guess when it was at 90 94ish when Savage had left, right? Yeah, he left at the end of 94. So 94 early 95, it's in California. So I have flown from East Tennessee obviously cuz I'm still in Smoky Mountain to California uh, to San Francisco I believe or you know Oakland whichever airport it was. <clears throat> the point is I get my rental car and we're going to like Sacramento or one of those towns. that's about an hour, hour and a half out of the Bay area and, and doing raw that night. And I'm in plenty of time. It's raining, but not hard. I'm driving down the interstate, just about to go across the, the bridge or whatever. I've just come across the bridge and still on the major interstate there in the Bay area. And I'm right in the right lane. I'm just chugging on down the road and this 18 wheeler just doesn't see me. And decides to change lanes. And right as I am, I'm on his right side, right as I go past him, he just decides to get over and he, you know, does the pit maneuver to me, right? Like you see on cops. And all of a sudden my car is sideways because it's raining and it's wet anyway. I'm looking at like Mac out my left hand window or my driver's window because I'm T-boned and he's pushing me down the fucking highway. Well, now he sees that he's got a car on front in front of him. So he hits his fucking brakes. When he does that, I continue moving. <laughs> this is a five lane interstate in the Bay area about one o'clock in the afternoon on a weekday, right? I somehow managed to go from getting T-boned in the right hand lane to being shoved down the highway to spinning around a couple of times and ending up pointing forward in the very left far hand lane without hitting a single goddamn car. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck? You, what the fuck? Right. And so now the cars are, they're all slowing down because they see what's happened. And I'm fucking, I have to start the car again because it, it quit about midway through that. It stops. I start the car again and it's running, but now my windshield wipers won't work. And it's fucking raining. And I wait till all the cars are stopped. I go across to the right hand side, right? And I because that truck is pulled over. And he comes up, he's like, Are you all right? I said, I'm not fucking happy. And now you know, and there's where you insert, you know, if I was a midget, they'd say, Well, in which one are you? But anyway, <clears throat> I said, No, I'm not fucking happy. What the fuck? He said, I didn't see you. I did, I said, I was I was right there. I don't know what to tell you, dude. I was driving at the same speed in the same lane. I don't know what the fuck, you know. And so anyway. They call the cops, they take the report of the whole goddamn thing. Well, there's no cell phones. So I've got to go somewhere, obviously, to get a new rental car. And secondly, to call them, tell them, blah, blah, blah. So I have to go. I've, I, that's what I flew into San Francisco airport and I had changed cars at the Oakland airport. That's what it was. I didn't even make it any farther than that. I take the goddamn car into fucking to the Oakland airport to Hertz and get another car and call the office in Connecticut. Who's going to delay the information over to Sacramento. <laughs> and I get in a fun car and, and, and get there just in time, miss the production meeting and everything, but I get there just in time we're, we're going to go on the air live in like 45 minutes. So, I mean, you know, it's time to sit down, look at the format and whatever the fuck, but just once again, just goddamn headache and stressful of a fucking day and driving from where I was to the Oakland airport with my head stuck out the window in the rain because the windshield wipers didn't work. And then just to top it all off, I got a letter from Hertz that because I had not, uh, uh, taken all the insurance that I was going to be liable for this, that, and the other thing. And I took that letter and I balled it up with a letter to the trucking company people what we're representing the truck driver and i said i just got this in the mail and if i get this again or anything like it or anything else from anybody asking me for a goddamn penny then i'm gonna sue your fucking ass for fucking uh, uh severe mental distress destruction of property goddamn whatever the fuck else i can and almost making me miss a national television show 
And I really think if, if you, if you should, you ought to send me the goddamn money for this stamp back that it took me to mail you this. <laughs> I didn't say thank you. Fuck you. Bye. Cause I hadn't come up with that yet. But I said, don't lose my number. Don't ever let me fucking hear of any of you people ever again. And I never heard of anything ever again. <laughs> never worked. again. Wow. But anyway, so that's, that's why today I hate to rush. I get anxiety. I hate being late because for so many years it was a constant. I mean, that's just, there's, we could be here all fucking day and we already have been probably for some people. Uh, but uh, no, all those years doing all those things and fucking photo finishes and goddamn running on to Southwest airlines planes after shows in South Texas or breaking down in the middle of fucking nowhere or goddamn being stuck in airports for hours and then having to rush to make up for it or whatever the fuck or weather, fire, flood, famine. <clears throat> I don't like to rush. I leave a day before the fucking show these days. And I come back a day after I need to, and, I, and then I need time to recuperate. The fact that you sent that letter and that they actually listened and never wrote back to you is amazing. It reminds me of a story in a really good book called We Got the Neutron Bomb about the Los Angeles punk scene. It's an oral history. And someone says, yeah, they, I got this tax bill in the mail and I didn't know what to do. And Black Randy from Black Randy and the Metro Squad said, here, here's what you do. And he took a big red marker and just wrote on the tax bill, Viva la Angel Dust. And sent it back, and he said they never heard from the IRS again. Amazing. I have, I've actually, I've written a number of, of letters to people saying, you're not ever going to hear from me again, so either quit writing me, or in some cases, if you don't take care of this, uh, you know, shit will take place. And it, it usually works. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. 